Hello, welcome to Nailing It Down, and this is going to be a pedagogical rant. Not something we normally do on Nailing It Down, but it's something that I think is important to understand the project, both in the series we are doing with This is Revolution, with Jean Bajalon, on nations and nationalism, and also what I am doing and discussing concepts here. I have been faced with the reality lately that what has traditionally passed for education, both in social, socialist circles and in public education, has largely started to decline. The reasons for that are complicated. And actually, if we are materialists, not moral or even totally without expectation. The ease of communication often means that memification, simplification, uh, gradual spread will actually, quote, move the Overton window, a concept that I don't think is particularly useful, in that it exposes people to ideas that were otherwise hard for them to glom onto. But this often has a double-edged effect. Making things simpler for people also reduces the incentive for people to be able to complexly understand a situation. And you have seen the degeneracy of the way people who engage in political rhetoric and whatnot tend to be, frankly, somewhat simplistic in the way that they present things. This is partly because there is a feedback loop between the educational subject and how educational content is presented. Take the example of the chat AI. We now know that most of the functions of writing can be farmed out to an AI rather effectively. No, this AI does not think like a human. What it does is mine the, the almost infinite amount of information put into it and compose grammatically competent, semantically competent content. Now, if you've ever taught freshman 101 or high school English or high school social studies or any humanities for that matter, you will know that semantically competent and syntactically competent writing has become rarer and rarer. It is less of a useful skill. It is also less needed to illustrate intelligence because it can be faked. This has been a Red Queen game, to use a metaphor from Alice in Wonderland, going all the way back to the beginning of the encyclopedia. And there are other educational contexts that have already moved away from writing. For example, I've talked about in the, uh, with my students in the Spanish context, often presentation is favored over writing. So verbal rhetoric is favored over written rhetoric, um, etc. But I can also tell you that people do actually benefit from having things written down. And that's been a constant frustration that people have with me is that I don't tend to write articles or books. I tend to write poems. Um, we can't say the decline of this literacy is just a failure of the educational system, but it is a failure of the educational system in the developed world. And not just in the U.S., but you see parallels in France and England, and I think we will eventually see parallels in Canada as well. The ability for machine learning to replicate what is essentially human syntax actually has implications for people being able to persua persuasively create arguments. This skill will atrophy without use. And so one of the things about moving to a visual medium, and if I really took this seriously, I would hire somebody who's better at video editing to do this for me, is that we have to start thinking about visual literacy and the literacy of rhetoric, verbal, and video as a way to illustrate someone's competence in a way that writing just frankly won't do anymore. Now, what does this have to do with political education? Because it's not apparently obvious. Except that whenever I do a topic, people ask me increasingly to cite sources. 
Sometimes they think that I am only repeating other people's arguments and not synthesizing them themselves. Now, this is a habit that's largely picked up from post-secondary education. But it is a good habit. It is a way to check someone's sources. Uh, however, some arguments are unique. And other times I am synthesizing information from multiple sources, including audio sources. So one of the things we have to do in a project like this is understand how print has dominated our way we've had these debates in the past and what it means now that print really doesn't. Nailing it down is an attempt to give the basics of educational rhetoric through what is essentially audio speeches with a very simple visual format, mainly a picture of my face that is moving. But if we're materialistic in our way that we talk about this, we need to break down what we mean by it. So when I talk about materialism, I mean three things. Social reproduction, which entails both economic reproduction and relations of production. And that is both relations between classes and relations between individuals. What constitutes a community? Right, as part of this. But there's another part of this, which is technological, which is the result of the two others. So I'm not a technological determinist in because I don't think technology emerges out of no context. And invented in certain contexts, technology won't do the things it's intended to do. For example, when Benedict Anderson talks about print capitalism in his book, Imagine Communities Being Crucial to the Development of Nationalism, and its utopian components and the consolidation of vulgar languages into concrete political identities, calling them concrete even there is a little bit questionable, but it has an effect on the world. We have to also ignore that that technology existed in Asia and was not used for that at all. And vulgarization, by that we mean printing in the common language actually happened somewhat simultaneously to when it happened in the West while the technology of the printing press was very old. So the social formations that led to that are complicated, right? We can't just explain it with the technology. It has to be the technology in its social context and what is the justification of those relations. So in the case of Asia, Confucianism, Buddhism, etc. cetera, um, actually justify elements of the ethnic and class conflicts that were going on. All right. Um, Shintoism, various uh, uh, Tigrisms, I can go through the various re religious ideologies. Um, these religious ideologies are more closely akin to what was Hellenistic philosophy or the kinds of religions we saw in the West prior to the Abrahamic religions becoming dominant. And with that, there's a certain kind of relations, but it's not just like it's at a, at a lower end of the developmental scale. It developed differently because the context and incentives were different in that particular region, right? We should not be Euro chauvinist in this idea here of impeding the stages of development in Europe onto the stages of the rest of the world. However, as materialists, we have to dig back down and look at what happens. You can't say the printing press is the cause of nationalism because it spread vulgar languages because the printing press did not do that in its original context in China and Korea. <laughs> All right, it was mostly used to preserve religious and state texts and vulgarization happened later, often um, at the head of state reformers and the development of of large-scale states, which were not truly speaking nation states in the way we think of them in Europe, right? Think about Sejong's reformation of uh, Korean and the invention of Hangul moving from Hanja, right? Now I'm speaking Korean context because this is a history I know very well, um, particularly for a Westerner, but that is a good example of this you have something parallel to the development of nations in England and France happening roughly, you know, towards the end of it um, in the case of Korea. Now, 
The reason why I say we have to be materialist about this, though, is we have to look at technological's interplay with all the other contexts, including the economic ones, but also other contexts. So, for example, we've seen a decline in literacy in most of the developed world since 2015. It's not been a massive decline. What we've seen is basic literacy, literacy up to a fourth grade level, being about the same, although post-COVID it has taken a dip and we'll see if it returns once COVID has, the COVID conditions have significantly normalized. I'm not going to say go away because it's not accurate. But we did see a consistent decline after 2015 in things like over eighth grade literacy. There's been a plethora of correlative examples, all of which fall prey to different problems because we can't prove the causation of any of them. Um, by that, I mean, there's been an idea that we hit peak nutrition around uh, the, the 1990s in the developed world, and there's no longer nutrition gains to intelligence and less literacy. Uh, there's there's uh, the idea, and I think more persuasive, that while screen entertainment um, was passive uh, for most of the 20th century, but very, very all over the place. I mean, think about television. We've had parasocial studies going on television, going all the way back to the 1950s. Um, the idea of interactive screen learning and whatnot is very, very new and truly interactive, not with very simple AI chatbots. Both in the sense of sufficient AI to, to, to machine learn and spit things back out from, from patterns humans produce without even necessarily thinking at all. There's no evidence that this thing is thinking like a human or understands human fuzzy logic. What these AI chatbots are doing is learning how to recombine in that way. Now, I'm a skeptic in whether or not this will equal actual intelligence, i.e. that these um, chatbots will be able to think on their own, that they will have anything like human or even animal agency. But I am con convinced now that it can mimic most of the phases of learning and make it very hard for this to prove that any human actually understands anything. Conversely, we have this we have this reading over into people's inability to understand complicated historical ideas in the political spectrum, particularly when they get most of their information about it from sound bites, five to ten minute video clips like, say, this one, and memes. All right. That is almost always going to be an aesthetic and superficial identification with a political ideology. Which means that like with trying to understand the decline in higher levels of literacy, we have to understand the inability of people to think in complicated political ways as a result of both the social and the technological context in which they find themselves. Neither explains it alone. You can't just will people into more complicated thinking. Nor can it be said that everything about this is degenerative, but a lot of it is. Increasingly, we find that groups cannot really articulate even how they have changed their own logic to themselves, which is very convenient to the bureaucratic structures that emerge around these groups because it's hard to know how to hold them accountable. But it's also hard for people to articulate why they are leaving these groups and what is or is not going on, and it's easy to project whatever you want to upon it. Now, there are other things that add to that. The fact that mass affiliation in any social institution has declined in the, tw in the 20th and 21st century, that, um, that has meant that epistemologies of understanding, even with people who superficially identify with each other, have become wildly divergent, even within groups that broadly think they share the same social notions. But it also means it's very hard to educate people on very complicated and sticky subjects or for them to be able to critique them in any way that is useful towards building a new subject. 
without using some of the tools that's leading to this degeneration in an opposite way. You will notice that I am hesitant to do things like editing. Part of that is because I just simply don't have time. But part of that is I also want people to have to pay attention. There is a way of making documentaries that involves quick cuts of, of visual material that constructs a non-argument. It makes you feel like there's been an argument made. It is most emotively quite compelling, but it isn't an argument. Right. I always pick on Adam Curtis for this. You can think that Adam Curtis has actually come up with a coherent narrative when you look at the images and his words together. But if you isolate them from each other, it becomes quickly apparent that it's more of a vibe. And that's where we are right now is more of a vibe. Nailing it down is actually looking at specific elements of the general gestalt, the vibe, and exposing how our prior Assumptions are simplifications of ideas, our inability to process the fact that our education, both public and political, is so shallow, is not the just the individual's fault. Now, yes, it is actually your responsibility in a collective agency to make yourself better, and that's going to involve self-discipline and pushing yourself. I'm a believer of the right to be lazy if it is earned which is a contradiction in terms, correct? But it is something to think about. So when we think about the chat AI bot, we also have to think about the way this is affect the way we talk about politics, because a lot of politics is essentially robotic responses that are ad hoc and mimic to stop people from thinking things through, to stop people from having to deal with complicated uh heuristics and to stop people from having to deal with sometimes there is no good answer for your political situation in picking sides in something that you have no control over that it literally a doesn't matter you don't have enough political agency and b uh it actually distracts you it has an opportunity cost from things you could be developing this is what nailing it down is about now, we are going to start this series on nationalism. We're going to start with uh, Benedict Anderson's book, Imagine Communities, and I'm going to go into my critiques of it, as well as uh, Gene Bagelon's critiques of it. And Gene is the specialist on nationalism, although he kind of specializes on the Middle East. Um, we are going to complicate all these books, and we're not going to come out with a clear it's good or bad. That is not my job for you. It is not my job to serve the evaluative function for you. It is my job to present the information for you. And this is the opposite of the way a whole lot of political media and punditry work. And, you know, often it's the reverse. We tell you how to feel, but not what led that to that feeling. You know, we tell you what stance the ideological discipline to have without understanding the logic of the ideology. We're taking a reverse stance here at Nailing It Down. It is your responsibility because it is difficult and because every element in your life makes it harder. Your phone makes it harder. All right. The, the stress you have for your, your moral commitments actually makes it harder to think. These are things you have to parse through and deal with. And we hope that in these brief intervisions, I can give you some of the tools to start reopening that back up that is so closed off in the kind of polemic world that piffiness and counterintuitiveness and narrative aggression get so much attention while thinking things through don't. And yes, that is not just your fault. That is the media landscape, which is a subset of the economic and social landscape you live in. And it does mean certain things are going to change. When we think about chat AI, we might not be teaching as much writing in the future, which means we're going to have to teach people how to make arguments a different way, not relying on the semantic and syntactic logic that is normally associated with the written language. All right. I hope that makes it 
a little clearer what we're doing here, even if it is a discursive way of getting around it. Have a great day.